So you get yourself a fancy A6700. Well, good for you. This is one of the best cameras that money can buy. So uh, let's set it up together, shall we? It's going to be a good time. So I'll just move to the side here so that you can see my screen a little bit better. I've set this to factory settings so you can follow along with me. Now, I speak many languages, but I'm going to choose uh, English. Now, yes, I understand your privacy notice. Connect a smartphone. Do not connect. No, thanks. We will do that another time. The smartphone can be connected. Yes. Okay, thank you. Set area, date, and time. Let's go with New York. And you know what? This is just a waste of time. So let's just go. Okay. When shooting from a tripod, use the auto power off temperature to high. Would you like to set that? Yes, I would. Always set your Sony recordings to high internal temperature. You will get much longer record times. So the temperature may rise. Yes, it's fine. Just okay with that. Now, this is telling you about the touch menu, the uh, new one where you can just swipe uh, to the right or to the left to get rid of this on screen menu. And you can swipe over to bring it back. And you can also do the quick menu if you swipe up. Very cool. I use that. Uh, a lot. So let's go to our settings here. That is my Ninja 5 on screen. This is main one and main two. This is a cool new uh, Sony system. You see this with their cinema line. Then they started using the FX3, FX30, and uh, now they're just putting it in their cameras. It's a nice quick menu with like another quick menu that you can access a lot of your settings on. So you can change your settings from here, but uh, we'll just change them in the actual menu itself. But as you can see, when you go into these mains, then uh, you can control a lot of your settings right away without having to dive too deep into the menu. And uh, also, we're starting on the video mode. I should have mentioned that, that um, I am using the switch it to the video switch here on the top of the camera. And we'll do video first, and then I'll go back and do photos. It's just I know a lot of video shooters use my channel. Okay, so image quality, file format. Now, this is, I go with the high efficiency codec of 4K. You can do the uh, all intro if you want huge file sizes and a little more information for things like like waterfalls, like crazy amount of motion. But for the most part, you, you won't need that in day-to-day -day shooting. Of course, you can do HD. And in HD, you can get up to 240 frames per second. So that might be something you want to do. But I go with the HS 4K. And I also have a V90 card so that I can reach... Uh, I uh, can have all of the file formats, even the 4K 120 up to its max. So setting the frame rate here, because I'm on the 4K, so uh, I'll set the frame rate. For me, I do 24. Now, like I said, you can do 60 for slow motion or 120. And uh, the frame rates here, I go to the highest one. And then it says you're going to need a good you know, card. So I, I have that. Uh, even for 24 frames per second, 4K, 100 megabits, 422, 10-bit, you won't need a super fast card. Uh, you don't need a V90 or anything like that, but uh, there you go. And these are the S and Q settings, and I'm not going to set these up. This for the slow and quick. So you can do, you know, quick time lapses, or you can do some uh, slow motion as well, and you can just set all that up in here, but uh, that's not necessary for this particular video. And once again, here is another way to do time lapses. Just turn off my computer. I'm getting emails because I'm very popular. Uh, time lapse settings. This is a new thing for the Sony cameras that's in the ZV-E1 and now this one where you can just set up uh, an interval time and see right there it says shooting time required for five second recording is five minutes at these particular rates. So I would set it at 24 because my project would be in 24. And, uh, and I should also mention for you people in PAL, this will be 25. So I'm in an NTSC region, and um, but if you're in a PAL region in parts of the world then uh, that aren't North America and a couple of others, then you are going to be in the PAL region. So you're seeing 25p for all of the things and 100p for the um, slow motion instead of 120. Okay, so let's just get back out of that. That is just a way to do slow motion time lapses. Now, this is the log uh, setting here. Do you want your log on or off? So if you turn it on, it goes into flexible ISO and you can use your log footage now. So you can also, let's go back to the main menu here and you can do that in this main menu here too. You see up in the top left corner, flexible ISO, you can change it from log um, to 
to uh, standard picture profiles there. So under the log settings here, we have the proxy settings. So it will actually record two files. It will record the regular file and then a smaller, lower resolution file that you can edit from. So you can edit those small files if your machine can't handle, say, the 4K60 or 4K120. Edit those small files, and then you can output the full resolution. So your computers, even if they're a little bit older and less powerful, you can edit proxies. You can also make proxies on the computers themselves, but it's nice that you could just do it right in camera. This lens compensation, you want to make sure that all of these are on auto and the distortion comp that will be uh, not grayed out if you're using a third party lens, let's say a Sigma lens, then uh, you want to keep that on auto when uh, you're connected to a third party in case that turns off. Otherwise, you may get some warping barrel distortion depending on your lens. Breathing compensation, this is available on certain Sony lenses like this one, the 15 millimeter 1.4. So I definitely like to turn that on to have, even though this lens has literally no focus breathing, I always turn it on just in case. Okay, so let's see, media format. This is where you would format your SD card and recover image database and display media info. It just tells you what is on your card. Now the file, you can write the serial number uh, on your embedded into your file. I don't see any reason for me to do that. Now this here, I think is a bit important. This is the file settings. You go in here and it says file number series, and that's good because you want it to keep counting up and not reset. And uh, see, do you want to reset the counter? No, I don't. And you can set it to reset every time, but I don't know why you would do that. And uh, right here, so I like I like when the files are in series, but I also change this here. Uh, this file name format I changed to title. You can change it to date and title or title and date, but uh, do the title and then I type in something like, uh, you know, A6700. There we go. A, go over here and do six seven zero zero and now um, all of my files will start with a6700 and then the numbers so that is a much better way especially when you're working with multiple cameras much better way to figure out which files were actually recorded on this particular device um, now the shooting mode this is just more s and q and the camera set memory that is if you want to uh, set any specific profiles to the one, two, and three on the dial up here. And there's also software ones here, but every time you format your card, you're gonna lose those you know, unless you put them back on the formatted card. So I, uh, to me, three is plenty for video here. So I will just set uh, custom memory profiles to that right there. Honestly, I don't really set my custom memory profiles much anymore because uh, the separation between photo and video is so fast. And I guess you could set up, you know, the 120 frames a second and the 60 frames. That would be a bit faster because I always end up changing the setting and the shutter speed. And then you might forget that. So any hoozles. Let's go back here, go back into the menu. Shutter and silent. This is, you can make it silent mode. Um, and this release without lens, that's enabled, which is good. You want it to be enabled in case you use a manual focus lens, then uh, you'll still be able to record with a manual focus lens. Now this right here, this is cool. This is the anti-flicker set. So you can do variable shutter. And when you're doing variable shutter, you can dial in your shutter very uh, specifically to eliminate flickering that might be happening in lights. So if you see flickering in lights, you can do the anti-flicker TV scan for yourself, or you can just dial it in, you know, see that going 256 to 253, very, um, you know, specific shutter speeds to get rid of some flickering and banding that you might be having in your photos and video. This is your audio recording. It's, uh, you know, standard right there. The audio recording levels defaulted at 26. Usually if I'm using external microphones, lavaliers, I keep it down at about seven and then my lavaliers seem to work pretty well. Uh, did I miss anything here? This is the time code stuff, it's not relevant for what we're doing. Image stabilization. So comes out of the box, the standard, which is the IBIS in the camera, uh, off or active. The active works quite well on this, I find. And uh, especially if you're using Sony lenses, if you're using third party lenses, your stabilization isn't quite as good. Um, but if you are using the Sony lenses, something like the 11 or the 15 that I have on here, boy, they, they Steady shot is is quite good. Now, since if you're just going on a tripod, you can just turn off all of the steady shot. 
Now, this is the zoom. Right now, it's an optical only, which means it will only use a zoom that has a lens with a zoom. But you can change this to clear image zoom or digital zoom. You stay away from digital zoom, in my opinion, um, because that will degrade your image noticeably. Clear image zoom does a really good job of giving you zoom, like extra focal length. And uh, in this guy, it still keeps your subject tracking and your autofocus and your eye detect autofocus. So essentially, you can get a lot more reach out of your lenses, up to 1.5 times. And they do such a good job with whatever magic they're doing. Sony says it's not technically an upscale, but a shifting of pixels around. But I, I don't understand exactly how they do it. But I do know that it works really, really well. And then you can set the speed of that. and um, you can set this to a custom button, and then uh, you can uh, just zoom in to up to 1.5 times. See, here it is here. And as you see, we're just zooming in here on my Ninja 5 up to five times. And now I'm going to zoom all the way back out. Pretty cool. This is uh, That is very usable. And uh, now let's go back in. This here, the shooting display, this is where you can do your grid line. So if you want a rule of thirds, something like that, or a square, or the diagonal and square, which I use a lot when I'm doing landscape photography. It won't show up if I show it right now on the Ninja 5. But uh, and right here, the marker display, that is not relevant for us. So in the shooting display, we have the self timer. You go in here, and then you can just set it so that you can press record, and then uh, walk over, hit your mark, as the kids like to say in the acting world and then the uh, camera will start. You guys know how timers work, right? And you can adjust the time, three seconds, five, 10, whatever you want. And uh, then you have the auto framing settings. Now this one is special for the A6700 and the ZV-E1. It uses the AI uh, processing unit to keep you in the center of the frame. So you can choose so basically, your camera could be on a tripod, and then it will zoom in a little bit on you, depending on your preferences, and then follow you around to kind of make sure you're in the center of the frame. It gives more of a dynamic movement, and it's also a way to zoom in and zoom out at certain intervals, and I'll show you that now. So if uh, you can choose the crop level of medium, small, or large, and uh, also you have the auto start. Now, so it just, you have a start when tracking, so that will be enabled if you're using the camera normally. And then, so when you track an object, it will start to try to keep it in the center or just auto start, it'll just start on its own. Then the auto start with 15 seconds or 30 seconds. So with these things, this kind of cool, at 15 seconds, it slowly zooms in and it slowly zooms out at 15 second intervals. Same thing with the 30. So that's a lot of fun. You can have more dynamic type of things and you, you, with the type of shots with this. And you can set your tracking speed to try to make it, you know, more natural for yourself. And what's super cool is if you are recording from a Ninja 5 like I am, you can have an HDMI output that is not cropped and has the full actual readout. And then the one on the SD card is cropping in and out. So you could get many different angles. So now we're moving on to the exposure tab. This is the auto slow shutter. So uh, as it gets darker, then uh, the shutter speed may slow down. You can turn that on or off if you want. It depends on how you like to shoot. Uh, this is ISO auto. It is currently on ISO auto. So we can turn that to whatever we want. Right here is uh, the eight base ISO for S-Log3 is ISO 800. I'll just uh, turn that off or turn that on for now like this. And now with the ISO range limit, uh, make sure that that is at the minimum and the maximum of 102, 400. Now that is for uh, photos. The maximum of the ISO for video will be ISO 32,000. This is your exposure compensation. If you're in some automatic modes, you can adjust the exposure. Because say you're in aperture priority, you can adjust the exposure compensation up or down depending on the brightness. Metering mode. Now here's your different metering modes. I just like to leave it in multimeter. You can do yeah, experiment with these if you want, but multimeter works really well in like 95% of the things that I do. Face priority multimetering, this is on uh, by default. That is good because um, you want to expose for your mug if that is the thing in the shot. And the camera does do a good job of uh, if it's your face that's in there, it'll try to get the exposure correct on your face as opposed to say a bright sky in the background. It'll just blow out that sky and get your face 
in the proper exposure. Spot metering point, that is center, that makes sense. Uh, white balance here, we are in auto white balance. Now you can choose the daylight or the shade or the cloudy, incandescent, all of these different ones. Auto white balance underwater. And uh, this is the Kelvin, so you can just dial that in yourself or you can uh, set the white balance manually by going over here and clicking it and using a gray card. And uh, that is how I do it. It's very quick. I do it from the uh, quick function menu and I just set my white balance manually every time. Shockless white balance, that's a way that when it's doing the white balance for you, when you're doing it in auto modes, you can choose fast or slow and it will adjust it without a jarring look that some cameras have, which is cool. The dynamic range optimizer, uh, I'm in S-Log3, so that is off. I leave that off anyway. And the picture profiles, these are off when you are in um, S-Log3. So let's turn off S-Log3 so that we can look at these picture profiles. So I've turned off S-Log3. So now uh, you can see the dynamic optimizer is on by default again. I like to turn that off. Some people like to leave it on. It just, uh, you just do what you want. Creative look, this is just, you know, like a, like a Fuji camera. They, they have their own profiles here for the creative looks and you can do any, choose any of these if you want. I always stay away from them because I do my own color grading, but look at that, you want a sepia look? There you go, you can do that. Let's go back to the standard profile. So now let's take a look at the picture profiles. Now you have picture profile off and it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, and then it skips to 10 and 11. And the reason it does that is because it moves uh, picture profiles 7, 8, 9, which are the log profiles, to the log shooting. Now you can program any of these picture profiles to be the S-Log3, let's say, and then you don't have to switch it over to the log menu. You can just uh, do it that way. But um, I just go into the log menu and I change it. These picture profiles, for anyone wondering, they are just some settings, some random ones that Sony has chosen that they think you might want to use. You can change any of them. You can make them all identical if you want. You can make them all S-Log, HLG3, whatever you want to do. So um, you can just do that. I personally don't change them much because like I say, I either use picture profile off or I use S-Log3. Now down here, this is awesome. You have manage user LUTs so you can import your own LUTs. I like to use phantom LUTs and the leaming LUT and so I can just load them onto the camera and instead of looking at my gray S-Log3 footage, I can see what the image is gonna look like in post. Soft skin effect, this is in the Sony cameras. I don't know who uses this, but I certainly don't. It looks, maybe I should. Maybe I should, I would look a little bit better. To me, it looks a little digitally and uh, don't love it. So I leave that off. Zebra display. Now I use this a ton. So the zebra display for me, like I use the Leaming Lutz, so S-Log3, I, I set it to uh, 85 on my skin tone and then I know I'm properly exposed for the Leaming Lut and S-Log3. If you're using standard profiles, 70 is usually pretty good for skin tone. And um, what's next? We have autofocus to manual focus, continuous autofocus for sure. This is so, this camera's so good at autofocus. Autofocus transition speed, blast it, man. It's responsive, blast it. I just, I like it super fast, but you know, I'm not trying to do cinematic things where like I'm shifting the focus slowly and whatever. I'm just trying to keep my dumb face in focus. And you can use the autofocus assist to uh, make sure that you are in focus. The focus area, wide, I like the wide. You can, you know, do the flexible spot, the expanded spot, center fix if the thing you want is going to be in the center, but uh, wide, it covers, the autofocus covers such a big part of the sensor that uh, I think the wide is fine for pretty much everything. Uh, the, you can do, you can experiment with this focus area limit so that if you don't want the other ones, say, say you never use center fix or um, expand spot, you can just untick those so that you uh, don't have to see them in the menu and they don't muddle up your life. Focus area, you can have white or red. Circulate a focus point, does not circulate, leave it there. AF, frame move amount, I leave that on standard. Subject recognition, yes, uh, of course, In uh, by default it's on here. On the human, you can choose animal and bird, and that does work if you switch between animals and bird a lot, and uh, it does a pretty good job, but if you know for sure you're just gonna do dogs or cats, stick it on the animal, and if you're birds for sure, there you go. Insects, cars, trains, airplanes. So it's cool that it can recognize all of this 
those things, all of those things, and it does a really, really good job. And again, if you want your menu a little cleaner and you don't take pictures of anything besides humans, you could uncheck all of the others if you wanted. Right, left, eye select, I just leave it on auto. It does a great job. Subject recognition, yes. Face memory, so if you want to, you know, uh, let's say you're shooting a wedding, you get the bride and the groom, their egotistical faces, you can register them in so that uh, the camera will pick up on their dumb mugs more than everybody else. And face register priority, focus map. This thing um, is, I actually find it very useful, especially product uh, when I'm doing videos and I'm trying to show a product. And like, I just want, say, just the A6700 text in focus. It's really hard to see that with focus peaking. So uh, the focus map, it uh, creates that crazy blue, like, uh, see that the only thing in focus here is the Ninja 5. And uh, the blue area is not in focus. And let's say I just wanted this thing in focus right here, this knob of my tripod. Then, you know, I like the focus mapping. It looks a little confusing at first, but it really lets you hone in on what is in focus. Focus magnifier, you can change the magnification so that you can punch in and see what is in focus. Focus magnifier time, if you want it to disappear after a second or two or five. And uh, the initial focus magnifier, you can punch in a lot at four or go with the one times. Peaking display, this is just to show you what is in focus. So if you have your peaking display on, it will uh, show it in uh, white, red, blue, or yellow, depending on your choice. And you can make the peaking level high, low, or mid. But again, like I said, I find that the focus map actually works better than the peaking for the most part for me. Now we have the playback mode and I'll just leave this alone because that's just looking at the stuff on the camera. Not really that necessary. And uh, here is where you have your connectivity. So your streaming and uh, your PC remote, and if you want to use mass storage and things like that. Whereas, uh, you know, the USB-C streaming, I'll go into that for a second. Because as you can see here, look at that. You can go all the way up to 4K30, and that is what I do when I'm streaming with the ZV-E1, and I've also streamed with this thing for four hours, in fact. Just through the cord, no overheating, fantastic. Uh, movie, do you wanna to record to the card as well when you are recording? Because I record in the Ecamm Live, so I don't record to the, car to the card, so I disable this, so it's less taxing builds up less heat because if you do enable it, then uh, you, there's more power consumption. So uh, I will disable that because like I said, I record through Ecamm Live. If you want to do it through the you know SD card as well, just go ahead. Wi-Fi connect, uh, the Bluetooth for connecting to things like gimbals. And uh, this is like uh, all these network options and airplane mode if you want to save batteries and you're not connecting to anything else. But yes, in my initial setup, the only thing I change is my streaming settings. Now we get to the little toolbox here. Some people call it a briefcase. It's clearly a toolbox. Area, at least I think it is. Yeah, area, date and time speaks for itself. This is where you would switch it between NTSC and PAL. I'm in an NTSC region, so I'm gonna get 24 frames per second, uh, 30 frames per second, and 60 and 100 and 20, uh, whereas in the PAL regions, you'll get 25, you'll get 50, and you get 100. So don't let that confuse you if you're not in an NTSC region. So uh, this is the settings reset. This is what I did to initialize, initialize the camera so that uh, I would be able to go along with you find folks from the beginning, and then you can save and load settings to an SD card. So you could just save some settings and then uh, you could give it to somebody else who has an A6700 and they can just put in your settings. Now this operation customized, you'll wanna spend some time doing this. So you can set up all of the dial, very customizable, change the buttons and the dials to whatever you want for the photo menu and then also the uh, video menu. So right now the video menu is set to follow the camera's menu depending on how the buttons are set up, but you could separate them and do more specific ones for video, in video when you're on the video tab or in the uh, photo tab. And these are the custom key settings for the playback menu. I don't really touch these. The uh, FN menu, this is the quick function menu settings. This, I definitely do change a bunch of these. And as you can see, once again, they're separated, thankfully, for photo and video. So you, uh, when you press the little FN button on the back or you swipe up with this camera, then you uh, can get these quick function menus. And I actually use these mostly. I rarely dive into anything else other than the quick function menu when I have it set up the way I like. This one is very important, different set for stills and movies. Yes, you do want, see right now, none of this is checked. Now I want it all checked. Shutter speed, ISO, exposure compensation, metering, white balance, 
picture profile and focus mode, everything, because I want to switch from photo to video and not have any of the things carry over. I don't want it to be in S-Log3 when I'm trying to take photos. You know what I mean? I want it completely different. So this is the screen display, what you want on the uh, viewfinder and the monitor. You can, I just leave it on the default at first. And then when, when you get more used to it, you can decide what you do want on your uh, EVF and on your LCD screen. This is the record with shutter. If you want the shutter button that takes photos to also start the video recording, you can do that. I don't change that because I like the fact that it already has a red record button and I keep those two things separate. The zoom ring rotate, you can assign the wide angle telephoto to the left or right rotation of the zoom ring. I don't do anything with that. These are customizing the dial settings for again, photo and video. So if you want to change these uh, dial settings and these keys, then you can do it right here. Same thing here with the video. You can also customize the dials, the front and the rear and the control wheel to do whichever one you want. If you like aperture on the front or shutter speed on the front, just set it up the way you like it. I like the way they have it personally. AV TV rotate, I just leave that where it is. Dial wheel lock, you can actually lock the buttons and the dials so that they won't mess up with your recording. Let's say you got everything set up and you're ready to shoot. You can just lock that right there and then uh, Bob's your uncle. Nobody can come by and mess with your settings, you know what I mean? Who are those people anyway, trying to mess with your settings? So with the touch operation here, you definitely wanna leave that on because there is a lot of good touch functions for the screen there. And if you go, I leave it on touch panel only, you go into the touch panel settings, look at on your shooting screen here, like you can swipe left and right. And so you can change these things around. I would just leave them at the default for now until you figure out how you'd like to set up your camera. The accessibility, there's a screen reader for people who uh, are visually impaired, then uh, it can read things out for you. So uh, I am impaired in many ways, but visually I am okay. When it comes to the finder and monitor, so uh, if they, they mean, you know, the back LCD and the viewfinder, do you want it to switch uh, back and forth auto for you? And I do generally speaking, you know, if you're going to shoot video only, maybe you just want to actually uh, turn off the EVF so that you can look at the back of the screen or you're doing photos only and you're going to look at the EVF, you know, uh, same thing. Monitor brightness. Manual is fine when you are indoors, but in bright sunlight, you definitely want to go with sunny weather and uh, then you'll be able to see your screen a lot better. It's not the best LCD in the world, but it does get the job done, especially if you set it to sunny weather. So the viewfinder brightness and the finder color temperature are actually grayed out for me right now because I am recording this, but uh, the display quality, I just leave that on standard because it's better for battery life. Uh, the monitor flip direction is auto or you can just do the horizontal 180 or no flip. I leave that again on auto. Uh, this counter, leave it the same for me. This is the gamma display assist. This is the way that Sony cameras used to be able to, you know, look at the log footage and not look so gray and washed out. But now you can import user LUTs. So I actually don't use this because I want to use my user LUTs. And this is where you would tell the camera to display your LUT or not if you have it loaded on for say your S-Log3 footage. I'm in standard picture profile right now. So that is grayed out. But if I was in uh, a log profile, I'd be able to turn this on and display my lot. This tells you what is remaining on your card for your shoot. This is the auto review if you're taking photos and you want to take a photo and then look at the back of your screen and have it pop up automatically. You can do that. I find that a pain in my butt, so I don't do it. Shoot mode select screen. I leave that where it is. Auto power off, monitor off does not turn off. I leave that power start save time one minute. I usually put that on about five minutes because sometimes I'm fooling around with the camera and I don't want it to shut off right away. But in case I forget about it, I don't want it to be you know, 30 minutes or off. I find five minutes is pretty good. Uh, power save by monitor, both link. Again, power temperature. We set this at the beginning when the camera asks us, saying, hey, you really should set that to high. Because a lot of people in the past didn't know that you should do that for the Sony cameras. And when they got overheating, they got really mad. So Sony <laughs> puts it up right up front. Hey guys, put this setting on high. You say, and this device is, you know, same warnings. Sound options, this is just your volume settings right here and your four channel audio monitoring. Uh, the USB, USB connection mode, I do select when connected because uh, if I'm streaming, it just pops up, hey, you're streaming. If I connect it to the computer, it just says, hey, you're doing mass storage now. So uh, you can set those individually, but uh, I just do the select 
when connected. And uh, this power supply is, uh, yes, of course, I want it to be able to power the camera through USB-C or charge the battery. External output. Now the HDMI resolution. Now, if you are going to uh, shoot 4K, uh, 30, then uh, set it to that. Instead of the auto, I found I had some trouble with um, some of my live streaming when it wasn't, when it was set to auto. So I set it now to 2160 when I want to shoot 4K. Record media during HDMI output, on, output resolution, time code, all that. Now, this, I can't turn this off. This is the HDMI info display. That is how I'm recording this right now. So if you turn this on, it will show what's on your menu on the actual uh, external device itself. Now, unfortunately, that does black out your screen. So right now I see it's just black back here because I am looking here. Now, when you turn that info display off, it will show the image on your camera and the image on the external monitor, a nice clean feed, but, uh, and you'll be able to control your, meta, uh, your, your menu through your actual camera itself. But I'm just doing this for the tutorial. I do wish that was fixed and I could see my menu here or at least an image here. Do you know what I mean? Come on, Sony has been years of this. Control for HDMI, yes. Video light mode leaves uh, the sensor cleaning. If you need to clean your sensor, um, it'll try to do that for you. I don't find it does a great job of cleaning my sensor, the Sony camera, so I clean them manually with sensor cleaners. So right here we have pixel mapping and this is auto pixel mapping. So if I go into pixel mapping, it says, do you want to do that? And it'll reboot my camera. So I don't want to do that. So, you know, if, if you feel like there's something wrong with the pixels, you got a dead pixel or something like that, you can go in there. And then this auto pixel mapping is on. So you'll see that popping up sometimes when you turn on the camera and it says, hey, do you want to you know, do the pixel mapping. And as if you have the lens, say, facing, you know, an object, so it's completely black, or you put the lens cap on, then you can do the auto pixel mapping, and that may correct any issues you might have. This is the version. This is just tells you exactly what is the lens version and the body version in case you need to do updates and display the serial number. You want to do that privacy notice. And then we are back to the top and this is the my menu setting so you can add whatever you want to this setting for also very quick i personally I haven't even set this up because everything i want is already quick access for me but uh, let's say you wanted to completely customize your camera you can add items in here whatever you want and then uh, anything you're looking for let's say you format your sd card every five seconds then you can just add in the format sd card right here it'll be the first item in your my menu setting click ready to go. So it is very useful. I've used it a lot on my other Sony cameras. It's just this one has a lot of customizable functions and that swipe up touch screen and the fact that you can separate photos from video. Fantastic. Now let me switch over to photo from video. And as you can see, the screen got a bit taller right there because it's a three by two for photos as opposed to 16 by nine for the Sony. Sony doesn't do the open gate recording in any modes. So you are going to see the top and bottom cut off when you switch over to uh, the 16 by nine video. But I just want to go in to uh, make sure that you take a look at this. Uh, this is the J, I leave it on JPEG. You can also do the high efficiency um, photos, but I JPEG jives with more programs. So I like it now for JPEG. I always do raw plus JPEG and um, because I want the raw photos and the JPEG photos. Uh, JPEG in case I want to zip it off quickly and then it's done a little processing in the camera itself. Uh, the raw so I can have that raw photo that I can edit to my heart's content. And the uh, raw file, you can do compressed or lossless compressed. And uh, lossless compressed if you want to save some file size. I find that uh, I just, I like compressed because give me all of the information. I need all of it. JPEG quality, this is just for the actual JPEGs yourself. Might as well set it on extra fine. This is the size you can do 26 megapixels, uh, but you can also do 13 or 6.4. Let's say you're just, you want a small photo that you want to zip quickly. Instead of it being 26 megapixels, you can put it down to 6.4 megapixels, especially if you're going to transfer a lot to uh, the creative cloud, that app that they have, then you may want smaller file sizes if you're just, you know, showing people. But you're going to print them out. You're going to do a lot of cropping. They always go 26 megapixels. Aspect ratio, three by two, that's the default for photos. And then you can do the square for, I don't know, Instagram or whatever people are doing, 16 by nine, so that uh, it will mirror the same thing as an actual video file, or you can do the four by three if you want. I leave it on three by two. The file format for the movies, we've already set that up in our uh, 
video display, more movie settings, but we can leave those alone. Long exposure, noise reduction, you, uh, on. I like that for if I'm doing long exposures, it does noise reduction in camera, which does a good job. High ISO noise reduction, normal, low, off, depending on your preference. Color space, yes. Lens compensation, make sure all of that is on auto. Format of the card, we covered that already. Covered all of this in the video mode, uh, the memory set, so you can set your memory stuff to the photos as well. The drive, single shooting, we have high burst rate, so you can go high plus, and you can go high, mid, low, or you can do a uh, single shooting. So if you're doing bursts and birds flying and stuff, go with the high plus and uh, the buffer is actually pretty good. And you have the timer mode right here, 10 seconds. This one will take uh, three images for 10 seconds, five images. You can uh, do these different self timer modes. So check those out. This right here is the uh, continuous bracketing mode. You get three images at different exposures that you can blend together in post and create a more, a higher dynamic range picture. And uh, there's the single drive bracket mode where it does it one at a time. This is really cool, focus bracketing. This has been in other systems like Nikon for a while, but uh, so you can set up your photo to focus at different areas and then uh, take the pictures and then blend them together in post in uh, Photoshop. And then you can do those at uh, the focus stacking. So it could be in focus from very close to infinity. Very cool. And uh, the drive mode for white balance, if you want to set that. And this mode is dynamic range optimizer bracket low. I have never used that and I never will. I'll take it back to single shooting. I like being single shooting because I don't want to edit too many photos. Interval shoot function, this is where you would set up your traditional time lapse. Of course, like I said, in video, you can do the uh, the new fancy time lapse where it makes the file for you. But here you can, uh, you know, shoot your raw photos uh, like a traditional time lapse and, and then stack them together in post and do an extremely high quality time lapse. Silent mode settings, I have that to off because I actually like to use the mechanical shutter. You're not going to get any rolling shutter issues or banding and flickering lights, things like that. Now the electronic um, shutter, it does work pretty well because the rolling shutter is pretty low on this guy, but when I can, I like to avoid using electronic shutter. The E-front uh, curtain shutter, now you why, you might want to turn that off if you are using certain lenses. There's certain Sigma lenses where the bokeh can be, uh, the bokeh balls can be cut off a little bit if you are using E front curtain shutter. So, um, you know, you can turn that off. It does help trigger the shutter a little bit faster, but um, if you're not worried about that and you don't want any bokeh balls being cut off by certain lenses, then, um, you know, you can leave the E front curtain shutter off. Release without lens, this is for the manual focus. Release without card. This one, uh, I'm going to disable that, in fact, because it will take a picture even though there's no SD card in there. And then you can walk around, like I've done, taking pictures of things, thinking you're capturing images, but you're not because there's no SD card. This is the anti-flicker set, so you can do the variable shutter and, uh, you know, if in case you are using the electronic shutter and you do want to dial in your settings so that you don't get any banding or flickering. Image stabilization, of course, that's on with auto. We've got to do that. Now, zoom, you can't do this when your raw photos are enabled. So in fact, let's go back and uh, switch out the raw photos for just JPEG. And then we will go back into this menu and look at the zoom now. So the zoom is available. But you can do your clear image zoom now so you can get extra reach out of your lenses. But again, that is JPEG only and you no longer have your raw photos that are being captured to your card. So for me, I don't do this. In exposure here, you can do the bulb timer settings if you want, you know, really long exposure to keeping the shutter open to get those uh, milky waterfalls. You put your 10... Uh, stop ND filter on there. Oh boy, you're an artist. Here's your ISO range limit. Uh, it's set to 50 and 102,400. That will be really, really grainy footage, but it's nice that it can go up that high. It has good dynamic range when it comes to photos though, I must say. Okay, this one's important. ISO auto minimum shutter speed. Now uh, I can't do this when I am in manual exposure, so I'll switch over 
to uh, aperture priority. And now I'll go back as it's enabled. And uh, here, when you click on this, so you can do the standard shutter speed that they have set for standard fast, or you can program it to uh, something else, one over 8,000, go down. I usually leave mine at like one over 250. It, let's just say your kids are moving around and you're trying to take photos of them and they're coming out blurry, then uh, you can always up your shutter speed. But uh, sometimes in lower light environments, the camera is gonna try to lower the shutter speed. And so when you want, to get sharp photos, I uh, you put up your shutter speed. So I like to keep it at a minimum of say, for fast moving things, 250, even 500, even one over a thousand sometimes. So depending on your scenario, you don't wanna be down at shutter speed one over 15, for instance, you get lots of blurry photos. So for shaky hands like me, one over 250 or a, maybe even one over 500. Now with the exposure compensation, this is good in the auto modes. Say you're out and you know, uh, it's having trouble finding the uh, aperture priority. It's uh, in, in some of the automatic modes. You're in a snowy scene, let's say, and it's exposing the snow too bright or too dark, then you can just use the exposure compensation and adjust that for you right here. Here is our metering modes. And so it's same thing as with the video, basically. This is for your flash photography. We won't get into that. In this particular thing, white balance display, color, tone, dynamic range optimizer. Like I said, leave that off. Plus, uh, if you're using raw photos, that's not going to affect you anyway. Your zebra display, I usually leave that on 100 when I am shooting. And if I see zebras coming in, then I know, okay, whatever that is, is I'm gonna lose the sky in that particular photo because I see the, uh, the zebras. Um, so I usually put it on 100 or 100 plus. And then when you uh, see those lines in the sky, you know you are losing information or whatever you're focusing on. Here you have your focus modes, it's the same, your focus areas, your subject recognition, once again, that's the same, your focus magnifiers, all that stuff peaking, we've gone through all that. Here is the playback menus, and here uh, are the you know connectivity menus, if you wanna zip it to your phone, things like that. And then here are the toolbox setup menus, which we've already gone through, and guys, that is it. So there you go. Your fancy A6700 is now set up for both photo and video. Of course, you can change any of the settings that you want. You don't have to follow a blithering idiot like me, but that is how I like to set this up right now. I'm sure I'll make tweaks as time goes by, but I uh, really appreciate you watching. I hope you found this at least a little bit helpful and we'll talk to you again soon. Okay, bye-bye.